Dear colleagues, in partnership with the Deutsche Gesellschaft für Nephrologie, die Österreichische Gesellschaft für Nephrologie and the Associé Francophone de Nephrologie Dialyse et Transplantation, Marcus at Home welcomes Professor Peter Libby in Boston in order to discuss with him the role of inflammation in atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. Dear Professor Libby, dear Peter, it's a privilege for us to host you tonight. Thanks for being with us. Well, the privilege is mine. It's always wonderful to reach out to my European colleagues because I feel a little bit European myself. Professor Libby, from my side also, thank you very much indeed for, for joining. We're so uh, happy to, for, for this discussion. Just very few words to introduce you. I think not much is necessary. Professor Libby at the moment holds the Mellencroft Professorship of Medicine at Harvard Medical School. And he was Chief of Cardiovascular Medicine at the Brigham and Women's from 1998 till 2014. And everybody um, of the listeners uh, probably know him as a, an expert in cardiovascular cardiology, uh, general cardiology, but pre particularly preventive medicine, um, giving numerous uh, lectures and holding numerous public publications, particularly on lipid disorders and inflammation in atherosclerosis. I think that was one of your uh, most famous titles also in the most cited um, uh, publications. You had, I don't think we have the time really to, to um, list the numerous research awards um, you, you've been uh, given and the professional membership of, of various societies. We've also already in our discussion prior to this video alluded to your, to your European interest. And we read that you, among many others, also uh, hold a, a Dr. Honoris Causa of the uh, German Frankfurt University. Um, just to name one of many others. So we are very, very happy, Professor Libby. And, and we decided and, and asked you and you agreed to maybe start with a few introductory slides, uh, giving a little presentation, and then we'd like to have the opportunity to ask you some more questions if we have some time. So please, thank you very much again for coming, Professor Libby. Okay, great. So I was asked to speak about inflammation and the pathogenesis of atherosclerosis. And there should be something for everyone in this talk cardiologists, nephrologists, uh, beginners, and cognoscenti. Uh, so uh, the, if I get too detailed in some of the basic science, then I ask people to take a little nap uh, because I'll come back to a clinical bottom line by the end of my talk. Uh, these are my competing interests. Uh, what this slide says is that I consult very broadly, but also I decline all personal payments from pharma or device companies, although I do have some financial interests in startups that market no product. Well, for those who are new to the atherosclerosis field, I would refer you to this disease primer published in the Nature series that I put together with an international group of individuals to really bring people up to date uh, from the very basic part of understanding of atherosclerosis through some of its clinical ramifications. And many, many people have slides like this, which show that we start with an excess of low density lipoprotein as the most common and potent risk factor for atherosclerosis. The lipoprotein particles can accumulate in the artery wall and there through mechanisms that are not fully elucidated, can elicit an inflammatory reaction, actually described by Virchow in the mid-19th century. And that involves the recruitment of leukocytes, about which I'll have a great deal to say during this talk, the mononuclear phagocytes, which are more numerous. But pay attention to the adaptive immune cells, the T lymphocytes, although fewer in number they play pivotal roles in control and regulation of the immune and inflammatory responses that play out during the long period of incubation of this disease in humans. It is one of the human diseases with the longest inflammation period, incubation period, uh, lasting many decades. Now, we tend to think of atherosclerosis as a chronic, ineluctably progressive disease but in fact, underneath the cap of the atherosclerotic plaque, there is a pitched battle going on 
for many, many years in most cases. There's a battle between life and procreation and death, as depicted here. On the left, you see the smooth muscle cells, which can divide and produce extracellular matrix molecules, such as collagen and elastin and proteoglycans. But then the smooth muscle cells can go on, even as Virchow understood in the mid-19th century, to die. So we have this contest between life and death, procreation and death. On the other hand, the professional immune cells, such as the mononuclear phagocytes, can also undergo proliferation within the plaque, but then can die and form the necrotic core or lipid core, which plays an essential role in the pathogenesis of disease complications. So think of the atherosclerotic plaque not as a static or ineluctably progressive disease, but as a ongoing struggle between these forces of life and death. And in addition, at the molecular level, there is another battle going on between mediators that promote atherogenesis on the left of this slide. This is just a selective subset of some of the alphabet soup of mediators that have been implicated in the progression and complication of atherosclerosis. And on the other hand, uh, shown on the right-hand side of this slide, are a number of immune or inflammatory mediators that can mitigate this process. So once again, think of the plaque as a dynamic structure that is constantly undergoing evolution with these competing forces that drive atherogenesis and that can calm the inflammatory response. So we now understand that from the very inception, through the long clinically silent or stable phase of progression of this disease, and up to and including the thrombotic complications of this disease that bring the patients to our attention in the clinic most dramatically, inflammation is a key contributor to this process at all stages. Now, the thrombotic complications, which I've mentioned are the most dramatic consequences of this disease, are by and large due to thromboses. And for many years, we focused on rupture of the so-called vulnerable atherosclerotic plaque with a thin fibrous core that breaks here, exposing blood with its coagulation factors to thrombogenic material in the lipid pool in the necrotic core, leading to a thrombus that can include the vessel. We spent maybe a quarter of a century in my laboratory dissecting in, in increasing detail the cellular and molecular mechanisms that lead to plaque rupture. Consider the T lymphocyte, which can secrete a cytokine known as interferon gamma that halts the ability of the smooth muscle cells to make new collagen, which is required to repair and maintain the all-important fibrous cap of the atheroma that is all that stands between many of our patients and an acute thrombotic complication. We also worked out the conversations between the adaptive immune cell and the innate immune cells that not only regulate the expression of the potent procoagulant tissue factor, which makes it so dangerous for the blood to gain access to the lipid core, but also increases the production of a series of specialized proteins, enzymes that are members of the matrix metalloproteinase family that can degrade the ordinarily very stable macromolecule interstitial collagen that is as strong as steel wires of the same caliber and that lends strength to the plaque's fibrous cap to resist rupture. Well, I was asked by Nature uh, to update a paper that I wrote 20 years ago for Nature about atherosclerosis, and I chose as my theme, the changing landscape, what we thought we knew, what we think we know, and what we have to learn. Because the longer I spend in science and medicine, 
the more humble I become about what I think I know and what will be debunked in the future. And I came up with a number of points and counterpoints, but I want to focus in this shorter talk about this issue related to the mechanisms of thrombotic complications that I was just speaking about. We used to focus on the thin-capped fibroatheroma, calling it a vulnerable plaque. But I would like to argue with you shortly that the vulnerable plaque is a misnomer and that another mechanism of acute thrombosis is on the rise as a cause of arterial thrombosis in the coronary tree. Superficial erosion is very different from plaque rupture. As a matter of fact, it's almost like a hand in glove. If you consult this paper, it goes into detail about the distinctions between superficial erosion and plaque rupture as a cause of coronary thrombosis. It turns out that superficial erosion in the contemporary era is accounting for about a third to a quarter of acute coronary syndromes. So while it's in a minority, it is a substantial minority and one that may be growing as we were able to modify the plaque due to our contemporary medical therapies. Now, in addition to the changes in the mechanisms of thrombotic complications with a shift towards erosion from plaque rupture, I think that the clinical presentation of this disease is also changing. We are seeing more non-ST segment elevation myocardial infarctions and fewer ST segment elevation myocardial infarctions, and we see more myocardial infarction and less unstable angina. There are many data sets that make this point, but I use this one from Bobby Ye's work. I believe these are data from, from the Kaiser Group in California that show while there's a modest decline in myocardial infarction, which by the way, unfortunately is going the wrong direction in the last few years. But you see here around 2002, there's an inflection when non-STEMI begins to increase and STEMI is on the decline. Now, this is not just due to a reclassification of unstable angina to non-STEMI because the ultra-sensitive troponin assays were introduced after the inflection point here. So it's not just a matter of reclassification. So I've argued with some of my colleagues, Harald Pasterkamp and Hester von Rietem, that superficial erosion associates more with non-STEMI than with plaque rupture, and that this shift in the mechanism may actually account for the change in clinical presentation. So surveying the world literature on OCT a few years ago, we were able to discern that ST second myocardial infarction is by and large caused by plaque ruptures determined by optical coherence tomography, an intravascular imaging technique that gives us a really almost microscopic near field view of the arterial intima. On the other hand, the ST segment, non ST segment elevation myocardial infarctions are over 50% caused. Uh, by lesions that do not have a plaque rupture, presumably many of which are due to superficial erosion. So once again, the mechanisms, the cellular mechanisms are quite distinct between erosion and rupture. I focused for many years on the mononuclear phagocyte shown here on the left as a instigator of plaque rupture. But we also now have encompassed another class of leukocytes, the neutrophil and neutrophil extracellular traps, which are on the cutting edge of thrombosis research these days as contributors to the thrombotic complications due to superficial erosion. We also, in our group, worked out some of the mechanisms by which neutrophil extracellular traps, which represent a form of cell death of the neutrophil, a sort of a suicide, kamikaze, us death 
And when the cell that has been activated spews out its nuclear DNA, it can capture various constituents of the granules of the leukocyte and also pick up other molecules from the blood and localize them on the surface of the intima as a surface reactor, right where the mischief happens in thrombotic complications. And what we found was that the interleukin-1 alpha, which can be contained in the granules of the polymorph, can stick to these fronds of DNA and can activate the adjacent endothelium at propagating and really elaborating the inflammatory process at the level of the endothelium. So I've made the point that leukocytes are critically important in all stages of this disease from the very inception through to the ultimate complication. And with my incredibly talented uh, colleagues, Matthias Narendorf and Philip Swirsky, uh, we wrote this up uh, in the uh, last uh, decade about leukocytes that link local and systemic inflammation in ischemic cardiovascular disease. And we alluded to something called the cardiovascular continuum, which was hypothesized by my uh, mentor, Dr. Bromald, and my colleague, Dr. Victor Zhao. And as you see in this old black and white diagram, they called attention to this cycle between risk factors, atherosclerosis, myocardial ischemia, thrombosis, infarction, arrhythmia, sudden death, remodeling, ventricular enlargement, heart failure, and what we now call advanced heart disease. Well, we had the temerity to bring this into the 21st century when, based on experimental work, uh, which I was privileged to collaborate with, with uh, Matthias and with Philip, uh, we showed that when we have myocardial infarction, we elicit a neural response mediated by the sympathetic nervous system that can promote hematopoiesis. The leukocytes sometimes will take a way station in the spleen, then find their way back to the artery wall. And so what we found is that we can actually instigate at remote sites inflammation due to the consequences of an acute injury. And among the mediators, we invoked cytokines such as interleukin-1-beta, about which I'll have more to say in a bit. Now, I'd like to focus then on what may be new territory for many practitioners, both in nephrology and in cardiology, and that is the importance of the bone marrow in our diseases. So what is it that contributes to the accumulation of leukocytes in the atherosclerotic plaque? Well, I spoke very early on about recruitment from blood, talked about local proliferation, and in the spleen, we can get extramedullary hematopoiesis, but I'd like to focus on the bone marrow and talk about the regulation of hematopoiesis in the bone marrow in relation to this disease. Now, there are a few possibilities of accentuated leukopoiesis in the bone marrow in the atherosclerotic milieu. Inflammatory signaling within the bone marrow niche, the hematopoietic niche, or a new kid on the block that we call clonal hematopoiesis that is due to somatic or acquired mutations. Let's first consider the intrinsic issues within the bone marrow niche. With uh, Philip and Matthias, one can actually ask questions about what's happening in the bone marrow niche by taking bone marrow and performing RNA sequencing. And when one looks at the transcriptional landscape of what happens in the bone marrow of an atherosclerotic mouse versus a mouse that does not have atherosclerosis, we see one of my favorite pro-inflammatory genes, interleukin-6, is overexpressed, as you see in this volcano plot. Is the interleukin-6 actually causal in promoting the hematopoiesis, which causes some of the leukopoiesis and high white cell count that has been a constant companion 
of acute coronary syndromes is recognized since the 1920s. Well, one can do fancy experiments with genetically modified mice where one inactivates interleukin-6 in the endothelial cells and sorts the bone marrow of animals that are either wild type or have been infected with a virus that causes overexpression of PCSK9 to cause hypercholesterolemia, and you feed these animals a high cholesterol diet, HCD. And when you do that, and let me just focus on the bottom line here, rather than these uh, original data from the fluorescent activated cell sorting, we see that there are fewer progenitors for the leukocytes. There's this proliferation of the progenitors within the bone marrow. We see fewer pro-inflammatory leukocytes and actually uh, fewer granulocytes as well. So by blocking this one pro-inflammatory cytokine in endothelial cells, we're able to attenuate this drive to leukopoiesis that we see in hypercholesterolemic mice. So IL-6 is a promoter of hematopoiesis during experimental atherosclerosis. Now, what about the other possibility, which I called clonal hematopoiesis? With time, with age, with exposure to environmental mutagens, secondhand smoke, cosmic radiation, et cetera, we have mutants that are in the stem cells in our bone marrow that give rise to leukocytes. And we can develop clones of mutant leukocytes that have acquired a selective advantage for accumulation based on the genetic modification. So this issue of clonal hematopoiesis due to these acquired somatic mutations link in an unexpected way aging because it's a very age-dependent process depending on our total exposure to these environmental mutagens cancer because we're on the way to developing a blood cancer when we have these mutations and cardiovascular disease which has just been recently recognized so if you'd like to read about this i refer you to this article, but there are many more, including more recent updates about clone hematopoiesis at the crossroads of aging, cardiovascular disease, and cancer. So we define clonal hematopoiesis of indeterminate potential as having more than 2% of, a, of cells bearing the variant allele, the mutated cells. And most people who have this will never develop leukemia because it requires the acquisition of three or more mutations in the stem cells in leukemia driver genes to transform into a hematologic malignancy. So if you have one of these clones of mutant leukocytes swimming through your bloodstream, you only have a one half to 1% per year chance of developing a hematologic malignancy. The mutations that cause this selective advantage are really only a handful of the 40 or 50 odd known leukemia driver genes. And the most common are known as DMT3A or TET2. And as I mentioned, the acquisition of these mutants is a function of age. By the time you're 70, you have an over 10% chance of having clonal hematopoiesis of indeterminate potential and it increases. This is work done by my brilliant colleagues, Alex Bick and Pradeep Natarajan. So what's the connection between the somatic mutations in leukemia driver genes and cardiovascular disease? Well, it turns out that although the transformation to acute leukemia is rather uncommon, that the increased risk of cardiovascular disease is rampant, up to 40% increase in the risk of cardiovascular disease. With uh, Sid Jaiswal, who was one of the uh, discoverers of clonal hematopoiesis, we looked at a series of populations and adjusted for all traditional risk factors, 
and found that the presence of clonal hematopoiesis conferred a hazard ratio, 1.8, that was almost on the order of type 2 diabetes and more than hypercholesterolemia or hypertension. Of course, age is by far and above the biggest driver of atherosclerotic risk. And it's hard to open up a journal these days without finding a paper saying that this or that disease is associated with clonal hematopoiesis. So this is a growth area in many fields of medicine. So why does this happen? Well, there are a couple of possibilities. One is that a chip just accompanies aging. And as I just showed you, uh, aging is the strongest risk factor for atherosclerosis. Or there could be a causal relationship between these somatic mutations in leukemia driver genes and enhanced atherogenesis. So uh, joining up with uh, Ben Ebert and Sid Jaswal when he was a fellow at our Dana-Farber Cancer Center, that's uh, part of our unit here, um, we used genetically modified mice to try to close the loop of causality. So we crafted mice that had mutations in their bone marrow cells that replicate those associated with clonal hematopoiesis, in this case, TET2, and conducted the usual kind of atherosclerosis experiment. And what we found was, lo and behold, that there was an acceleration of atherosclerosis in the animals that had loss of function in TET2 in bone marrow cells. So uh, we were really able to implicate these mutations causally in promotion of atherosclerosis. Now, once we made these mice, we were able to play some tricks and we grew out monocyte-derived macrophages from bone marrow monocytes and performed RNA sequencing after stimulating those cells with various proatherogenic stimuli, including LDL cholesterol. And what we found was that some of our favorite enemies, interleukin-6 and interleukin-1-beta, were overexpressed in the animals that had the knockout for TET2 and carried the LDL receptor mutation as well. This not only occurred in mice, but also appears to happen in humans with TET2 clonal hematopoiesis who have overexpression of interleukin-1-beta and interleukin-6 in their peripheral blood cells. So just to bring you up to date, because this is a very fast-moving field, a few months ago, uh, we published this paper looking at the effect of clonal hematopoiesis on people who already had cardiovascular disease, not first ever event, but recurrent events. And what you see is as shown by the blue curves compared to the red curve, that if you have clonal hematopoiesis, it boosts your chance of having a secondary event in atherosclerotic events and all-cause mortality as well. The dark blue line is uh, what we call big chip with greater than 10% variant allele fraction, whereas the pale blue is any chip at all, including anything over 2%. And what's interesting is if we look at comparing on the same scale, the cardiovascular mortality with chip versus the cancer mortality, and remember these are mutations in cancer-causing genes, we see that actually the cardiovascular mortality is enhanced to a greater extent than the cancer risk. So uh, this is again a summary of this work showing that TET2, much more than DMT3A, and more than almost anything else that has been studied of, among these mutations can enhance cardiovascular disease. Okay, so we have had some exciting years in unraveling some of the basic science of this disease. What do we do about it? What's the practical bottom line? We have um, almost 2 million hits that take 70 milliseconds 
to generate in Google Scholar if we cross inflammation with atherosclerosis. And likewise, if we put immunology in atherosclerosis, we get almost 400,000 hits in 70 milliseconds. So that begs the question, can targeted anti-inflammatory therapy improve cardiovascular outcomes in humans? Can we translate inflammation biology from our animals and our test tube experiments to the patients that we treat? So this has been an obsession of mine for the last 20 years to try and answer that question. And if you'd like to read about the rationale for my choosing interleukin-1-beta as the first target to try to block, I refer you to this paper. One of the reasons that we focused on IL-1-beta is because it elicits from the cells involved in atherosclerosis, endothelial cells, small muscle cells, and mononucleophagocytes, proatherogenic actions in a very concerted way. Well, my history with interleukin-1 goes back a very long way. Back in the 1980s, my laboratory showed that we can induce the expression of the gene that encodes interleukin-1-beta in human endothelial cells or smooth muscle cells, not shown, when we stimulated them with what we thought at the time was an artifactual stimulus, laboratory stimulus, uh, bacterial lipopolysaccharide, LPS. And you see we very handily induced the messenger RNA that encodes IL-1-beta. Well, we showed in this initial paper, not only IL-1-beta, but IL-1-alpha was induced and that the protein and biological activity related to IL-1 was also increased by incubation with bacterial endotoxin. There's obvious relationship to sepsis, but since we have an increased appreciation of the importance of the microbiome, uh, we think that epithelial leak leading to little episodes of mild endotoxemia may help to drive atherosclerosis. You see here in 1997, we showed a dose response of increase in these pre-capillary vessels. In 1995, we showed the presence of an enzyme known as caspase-1 that can cleave the inactive precursor of IL-1-beta into its active form, which is 70,000 $17,000. And here you see that at higher power. The precursor goes to product in a way that can be blocked by the recombinant IL-1 beta or uh, by adding an inhibitor of the converting enzyme. Uh, finally, I'd like to point out that IL-1 beta is activated in vivo to its active form from the inactive precursor by a structure known as the inflammasome. The business end of the inflammasome is caspase 1, which we localized in the plaque, as you recall, back in the 90s. Uh, but the inflammasome, which can be activated by a number of disease-relevant stimuli shown here, is the way to convert caspase 1 or through caspase 1, convert IL-1 beta precursor to the active hormone. And here is a stained glass piece that was uh, conceived and executed in conjunction with Joel Coet, with whom I was a postdoctoral fellow, who in retirement from his teaching job has taken up stained glass and made this beautiful stained glass piece showing the long axis view of the NLRP3 inflammasome hovering over a blood vessel that is growing a nascent atherosclerotic plaque with these blue macrophages, the red erythrocytes, et cetera. So all of our interest in IL-1-beta led us to hypothesize that it might be a target for neutralization in patients. And so we conducted the first anti-inflammatory therapy for atherosclerosis in humans, known as the canakinumab anti-inflammatory thrombosis outcome study, or CANTOS, where we used a monoclonal antibody that selectively neutralizes IL-1 beta. Now, this intervention had no effect on atherogenic lipids, as you see here. 
but we did have an anti-inflammatory effect is gauged by a drop in highly sensitive C-reactive protein measurements as shown here. Well, the study met its primary endpoint. We had about a 15% reduction in overall events in this study. And that scores rather well with what we saw in the uh, studies that were done with PCSK9 inhibitors, such as evolucumab or alrocumab. The magnitude of the benefit in Cantos was exactly the same as in those pivotal PCSK9 inhibitory studies. And note that our baseline LDL was 10 points, 10 milligrams per deciliter lower than in the Fourier or alarocumab trial. Now, if one looks at the people who responded to the anti-IL-1 beta monoclonal antibody by dropping their C-reactive protein greater than media, you see, as shown in this pre-specified analysis, that there was over a 30% drop in cardiovascular mortality and in all-cause mortality, the holy grail of all clinical trials. Well, we paid a price in Cantos for blocking the innate immune reaction. We saw an increase in fatal inf infections, a very small increase, but it was statistically significant with 17,000 participants. But to balance this, the patients felt really good. They had uh, more than 50% fewer gout attacks. Gout is a crystal disease that is mediated by the inflammasome. And um, there was fewer arthroplasties. There was less symptoms of arthritis or osteoarthritis in this group. So what is the mechanism? Well, I refer you again to this paper, which goes through some of the mechanisms. And on the right side, you see something about cancer because we saw a striking benefit on cancer death, treating with the antibody that blocks IL-1 beta, primarily due to lung cancer death prevention. And we think that that is by blocking some of the procedures that we worked out in our lab that are induced by IL-1 uh, that can lead to smooth muscle cell lysis to breakdown of the extracellular matrix, and to metastasis of tumors and their eventual leading to death. Now, we're in an era of precision medicine, right? And so wouldn't it be nice if we could target expensive agents and those that may have unwanted actions, uh, such as impaired host defenses, such as the candikinumab monoclonal antibody, in a more rational way? And in an exploratory analysis, it was not pre-specified because when we embarked on the Cantos trial, we had no idea about clonal hematopoiesis. Uh, we designed the study in 2009, and clonal hematopoiesis was recognized in 2014. But in an exploratory analysis of the subset of patients who actually had DNA collected and genetic permission, uh, we saw that those who had TET2 clonal hematopoiesis responded better to the neutralization of IL-1 beta than those who did not have the mutations, the somatic mutations. So Cantos was a great start to this field. It provided an opportunity to test the inflammatory hypothesis for atherosclerosis and provided a novel therapy or an avenue to therapy to address residual risk and secondary prevention. Now, will all anti-inflammatory agents produce similar benefits? Low-dose methotrexate has revolutionized the management of patients with rheumatoid arthritis and certain other inflammatory diseases. And my colleague, Dr. Ritker, designed and got funding for a study to use low-dose methotrexate in patients who are at risk for atherosclerotic events. And as opposed to Cantos, this study was a complete null. And also, there was no drop in the inflammatory cytokines or in C-reactive protein, as well as no change in LDL. So although methotrexate is very valuable in treating arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, it seems, at least in the population studied, not to benefit individuals who are at risk for myocardial infarction. So again, this slide summarizes 
key differences between the positive Cantos trial on top and the negative low-dose methotrexate trial on the bottom. Well, fortunately, we do have some off-the-shelf medications uh, which can reduce inflammation and cardiovascular events. In the Colcott trial, led by Jean-Claude Tardif, there was a amazing drop in recurrent events in people who took low-dose colchicine in the early phase post-myocardial infarction. Colleagues from the Netherlands and Australia, New Zealand, performed the LODOCO2 trial, which showed a similar decrease in people who were in the more chronic phase of atherosclerosis. So where are we with colchicine therapy? Well, um, there's a bit of a concern about infection signal in this intervention as well. And you can't use colchicine liberally in patients who have chronic kidney disease because it is eliminated greenly. And very good news, just in the last few weeks, our U.S. Federal Food and Drug Administration approved colchicine in the dose used in the Colcott and Lodoco 2 trials as an adjunctive therapy with statins to prevent recurrent cardiovascular events. So where do we go now? Well, we talked about colchicine. There are many programs with inflammatory inhibitors, inflammasome inhibitors. And what about interleukin-6, which kept coming up in the RNA sequencing, as you recall? Well, uh, Hafid Etoufella from uh, the Park Center in Paris and Alain Tegui uh, went through anti-cytokine immune therapy in the treatment of atherosclerosis. And if you'd like a fuller catalog of the possibilities, I refer you to this paper. By the way, here's the stained glass window that shows the ribbon structure of interleukin-1 beta, again by Joel Coed. So why interleukin-6? Well, it's downstream of IL-1 in this inflammatory cascade, inflammasome to the inducibility auto-induction of IL-1, one amplification loop, and then a second amplification loop and a little bit of IL-1 where we get a lot of IL-6 as I showed, but did not discuss on a prior slide. So interleukin-6 is an interesting cytokine because it is a master regulator of what we call the acute phase response of the hepatocyte, causing the hepatocyte to take some of its substrate and energy and manufacture fibrinogen, the precursor of clots, and plasminogen activator inhibitor one, the major blocker of our endogenous fibrinolytic system. So when we have the acute phase response, again, it's a perfect storm. Increased fibrinogen and decreased uh, pi-1, and increased pi-1, leading to a blockade in fibrinolysis. Okay. Now, these are bad biomarkers, but we can measure this response by looking at uh, C-reactive protein or serum amyloid A. Well, my colleague, Dr. Ritker, showed more than 20 years ago that your IL-6 concentration in blood is like looking in a crystal ball for your propensity to have a myocardial infarction, as shown here. And this has been widely replicated. The index study was the one I just showed you from Dr. Ritker, but uh, here is a whole compilation of studies and a meta-analysis showing that there is a increased risk of cardiovascular events in those who have higher IL-6 concentrations. There's also very strong human genetic evidence that supports the causality of IL-6 and cardiovascular risk. There are variants that cause a loss of function in CRP uh, in IL-6 signaling. And you can see the concomitant decrease in CRP with different gene dosages of this resistant allele and decrease in coronary heart disease as well. So when we have a genetic defect in IL-6 signaling, we confer cardiovascular protection. And interestingly, if we look in just the group that uh, we might want to treat because of their high risk, those with chronic kidney disease, uh, if we want to look for a benefit of colchicine, we see it in those with normal renal function, 
but not in those without normal renal function. So this concern about how we're going to control inflammation in this very vulnerable group of those with chronic kidney disease was tested in a phase two trial called the rescue trial, where we randomized individuals with chronic kidney disease, stage three through five, to an anti-IL-6 ligand antibody, ziltivecumab, and measured as a primary endpoint inflammatory biomarkers. The study was led by Dr. Ritker and uh, Catherine Tuttle and Vlado Perkovic, nephrologists, were intimately involved in this study as well. What we found in a retrospective look at Cantos was that in the almost 1,100 individuals in Cantos who had chronic kidney disease, that both C-reactive protein lowering an anti-inflammatory effect and dropping the LDL contributed to benefit. But in those without uh, chronic kidney disease, only the anti-inflammatory effect held sway. Okay. Uh, so, uh, sorry, both the anti-inflammatory effect and the LDL lowering effect uh, were important. So we really think that one way to look at residual risk in this population of patients with chronic kidney disease is to focus on inflammation rather than LDL. And of course, that's congruent with what we know from the Aurora and 4D studies, right? Uh, where these are some of the only populations in patients with advanced kidney disease where statins do not seem to confer benefit. Although, please keep your patients on statins uh, who have chronic kidney disease. Um, so there's another point about targeting IL-6, and that is that it's downstream of IL-1. So we showed the blockade of IL-1 beta isoform can lead to an increase, small but significant, in infections. So maybe by going downstream, we can preserve IL-1 beta's protective actions against infection, but diminish cardiovascular risk by targeting IL-6. So that led to the rescue trial, which was a phase two trial with ziltivecumab that showed a profound decrease in C-reactive protein in individuals treated with this antibody ziltivecumab. And that was the prelude for a trial which is currently enrolling called Zeus, which is looking at patients with chronic kidney disease of great interest in nephrologists, but also those of us who practice cardiology know that this is a hotbed of cardiovascular risk. The patients that are on dialysis or with advanced kidney disease often die of cardiovascular disease. And you know, the I'll be on clinical service starting on Monday for a rotation of inpatient care. And the based on past experience, the median EGFR of my patients will be 45 or 50. So chronic kidney disease is rampant in our hospitalized patients and in our ambulatory patients with cardiovascular disease, particularly with the pandemic of obesity and diabetes, which we're living through. So where is interleukin-6 inhibition going? Well, there's Zeus, which is half enrolled already. Uh, there are two studies that are start, starting out, Hermes, uh, using ziltivecumab in patients with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. And in patients with acute coronary syndromes, the Artemis study. So where are we with inflammation and atherosclerosis? Well, it's a common contributor to thrombosis. And importantly, it's becoming clinically actionable with colchicine and those with adequate renal function and with some of these novel therapies that are under investigation. So where are we? Well, I think we're where Winston Churchill thought that we were at a turning point in the Second World War. Now, this is not the end. It is not even the beginning of the end, but it is perhaps the end of the beginning. So I'd like to thank you for your attention and open it up for questions now. Uh, and I managed to mention many of my collaborators from whom I've learned a great deal and with whom it's a privilege to work. Uh, some of them are shown here on this slide as well. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Dr. Libby, for this fascinating, fascinating, really fascinating uh, journey and uh, for open up totally new views for me as a cardiologist. I learned that it doesn't stop at the plaque, that we have to focus on uh, 
on bone marrow. Let me start off with a maybe too pragmatic or naive question. Um, we learned a lot, a, a lot about clonal hematopoiesis and about chip status. And is it realistic or is it really difficult to determine chip status outside of clinical studies? Is it something that can be done in routine? Yeah, yes, yes, so it can be done, but I don't think it should be done because we don't have any therapies which have been evidence-based to uh, allocate. So I have a chip clinic. I established a chip clinic maybe three years ago where I see patients who have been found to have clonal hematopoiesis. And all that I know to do is have a, a shared decision-making discussion with them and intensify their general preventive cardiology care because I think they're at increased risk, particularly those with, uh, with TET2 and uh, JAK2 mutations. Um, and uh, we're, we're trying to design trials where we're looking at uh, genotype patients and allocating therapies based on chip status, but that's going to be for the future. So I'm on record. I wrote a paper in JAMA about this uh, several years ago, JAMA Cardiology, I think, that says, well, we're not ready for chip testing in, in prime time. But, you know, um, the cost of sequencing is going down faster than Moore's law for, for you know, computer chips. And uh, I think it's inevitable that we will all have our sequence on our, on our phones or our, uh, maybe in a chip implanted in our, uh, under our skin so that when we show up in the emergency ward, people will be able to look at our genotype. But remember that these are acquired mutations, the chip mutations. So they're not something which uh, you can determine at birth. They're something which can be assessed later in life and which may change as uh, the variant allele fraction expands, which can happen particularly with TET2. Um, so we're studying, of course, ways to modulate that expansion because we know that the risk is proportional, roughly proportional to the variant allele fraction. So uh, not ready for prime time yet, but keep your eye on ways in which we may be able to practice precision medicine by doing chip genotyping in the future. But if I'm going to ask there, um, if, if would that be, an, just in your thoughts, wouldn't that be an option to actually individualize and to select patients for, for example, colchicine treatment, which is, which is available, which is inexpensive? And on the other hand, turning the question around, who, whom would you give that to? I mean, who, who are you going to put on colchicine? Is it just somebody with an elevated CRP with rheumatoid arthritis? Uh, what's your, what would be your selection there? I know we don't have the data, but from everything you've presented so so nicely, what what do you think? So I don't know about the uh, the segmentation of benefit based on chip status with various mutations in the colchicine studies. Unfortunately, the Colcott trial didn't have much in the way of biomarkers or DNA, and I look forward to seeing the Lodo coach two investigators taking their database and doing as much as they can. Uh, certainly, I think that one of the main mechanisms of colchicine action is by inhibiting neutrophil function. Uh, and certainly in some of the mutations, uh, such as JAK2, that may be very, very important. Uh, but we don't have the data yet. Um, so our exploratory analysis, post hoc analysis in Canto showed that those with TET2 mutations could respond to the anti-IL1 beta better. That's hypothesis generating. And there are a number of groups that are now trying to design clinical trials based on chip status. And I think that the place where I would start would be with, you know, the inflammasome pathway, which I talked about, inflammasome IL-1 beta IL-6, based on having TET2 chip. Uh, we also have with Alan Tall and colleagues, um, Trevor Fiddler was the postdoc who did the study, showed that with JAK2, uh, V617F mutations, common in those who develop polycythemia vera or other myelodysplastic syndromes, uh, that a different inflammasome is used, different flavor. Uh, the NLRP3 inflammasome is definitely a target in TET2 clonal hematopoiesis, but there's another inflammasome known as the AIM2 inflammasome that seems to be, at least in mice, important in JAK2 clonal hematopoiesis. Out like to continue with two 
question. So the first would be if we see these ever new treatments and if we get anti-inflammatory drugs in the future, should we reconsider our more conventional strategies? So would you see these treatments as treatments on established drugs or should we question whether we should still give, say, beta blockers and aspirin to all our patients with cardiovascular disease? Right. So in secondary prevention, I think aspirin uh, is essential. Beta blockers, um, you know, we're learning that maybe we don't have to continue beta blockers after an acute coronary syndrome forever, right? Uh, but certainly we're going to treat our conventional risk factors and all of the trials with anti-inflammatory agents do or should have very strong control of LDL in the background. Um, you know, if, if our LDLs were as low as that in most of the animal kingdom or as we were born in, atherosclerosis would be an orphan disease. So I, I think everything should be done on top of statins. And that's why I emphasize that in Cantos, we went to great lengths uh, to control LDL. Uh, most of the patients were on potent statins and our LDL uh, baseline was 10 milligrams per deciliter lower than the evolocumab and alorocumab pivotal clinical trials. Um, we knew that Cantos was going to be very controversial because there were many skeptics when we were in the 2000s and were designing the study. And so we designed it to have hard MACE as its primary endpoint, major adverse cardiovascular events, uh, which are harder to dispute than softer endpoints such as expanded MACE that includes revascularization, which can be potentially subjective. Um, and we also went to great lengths with our sites all around the world uh, to get the patients on the most potent statin in the highest doses that we could get them in the local, the local jurisdictions. Uh, so I think uh, moving forward, we may be able to allocate some of our traditional therapies based on precision biomarkers. But for now, we should keep all of our uh, post-ACS patients on aspirin and statin uh, particularly those with uh, impaired ventricular function on an ACE inhibitor or an ARB. Um, and uh, those with heart failure, of course, we're going to put on uh, an aldosterone uh, antagonist, mineral corticoid antagonist. But I think that the standard regimen, um, with the exception of prolonged therapy of beta blocker, uh, may well uh, be the baseline. So it makes clinical trials harder, right? And now with the drop-ins of SGLT2 antagonists and incretin mimetics, SGLT1 receptor agonists, et cetera, um, it's going to be increasingly hard to show a benefit of other therapies. And that's why we're thinking orthogonally that inflammation is different from lipids. So if we combine the two, we may get a bigger bang. And this brings me directly to my second question, which is kind of a philosophical question. So if we get ever better, if we bring down LDL cholesterol below 30 or 20 or wheresoever, if we now also target inflammation, if cardiovascular disease really becomes an orphan disease, where do we end up with our ever elderly population? So there must be an increase in oncological disease then. There will definitely be an increase in Alzheimer disease. So what are your ideas about this getting ever better in cardiovascular medicine from a society perspective? So, so look, the advances in oncology are, are leaps and bounds. So every year we're getting more targeted therapies and better therapies. So I guess our job in cardiovascular medicine is to keep the patients alive long enough so that they can get cancer. And the job of the oncologist is to take their cancer. Um, you know, dementing illnesses are often related to cardiovascular risk factors. So um, many forms of dementing illnesses, certainly multi-infarct dementia, uh, may be responsive or preventable by some of the same measures that we're talking about. Um, so look, I'm an optimist, but uh, it's too late for many of us, right? Um, so what we need to think about is primordial prevention. And we're going the wrong direction. We're seeing uh, the spread of obesity and consequent dysmetabolism and diabetes in youth. We're going the wrong direction in primordial prevention. Uh, so Perhaps with polygenic risk scores, we're going to be able to 
segment youth into a population that requires a particular attention to lifestyle, which everyone should have, right? A uh, healthy lifestyle, uh, but also maybe even pharmacotherapy. It's going to be very difficult to prove in a clinical trial because event rates are going to be so low in youth. Um, but this is something we're going to have to grapple with this is, uh, in a societal uh, way. So look, um, we all practice medicine one-to-one -one in our consultations. Uh, but we also have a responsibility as community leaders uh, to try to enhance a healthy lifestyle, uh, bicycle paths, um, physical education in schools, healthy diets, getting sugar-sweetened beverages out of the schools so the kids don't get addicted to them, uh, smoking cessation. Uh, so we have a responsibility as citizens, as public health advocates, uh, to go beyond our one-on-one -on -one end of one encounters as physicians uh, to be community leaders to try and improve cardiovascular health, including air pollution, right? Which is a huge problem. Uh, so, um, and cardiovascular risk factors. So we have a lot, uh, a lot to do and we can celebrate our successes in therapies that are based on science, but we also have to strive uh, to not only improve the environment but also to make the fruits of our research and clinical advances more equitably distributed. Uh, if we could get HIV medications to Africa through the PEPFAR uh, program in the United States, if we can get multidrug resistant TB medications to developing countries, uh, the greatest burden of cardiovascular disease is now in, in low and middle income countries. Now we're in rich countries, um, and we have better access to these uh, life-saving drugs and event-preventing drugs. But I think we also have a social responsibility as leaders to strive to make the availability of these agents more broad as well on a global basis. Um, maybe I have also two final questions. Um, so in your view of this changing landscape of atherosclerosis, everything boils down to innate immunity with IL-6 and uh, myeloid cells and IL-1 interspective therapies. Um, is there any significant part left for the adaptive immune system? And is there also a landing support? Because, the, for example, um, patients with uh, familial, uh, familial Mediterranean fever, they lend support to your hypothesis. They have a lot of inflammatory activity, increased atherosclerosis, but patients with severe combined immune deficiency, for example, or altered B and T cell activation, are they also at an increased or altered risk of atherosclerosis? Um, so, as, as I mentioned, the, uh, the adaptive immune cells, the lymphocytes, are fewer in number, but they may be like the conductor of the orchestra. They may be the generals while the mononuclear phagocytes are the infantry in the um, inflammatory cell army. Uh, so they're very important. And, uh, for example, Ziad Malat is conducting two studies that are directed against uh, adaptive immunity. Uh, where he is trying to augment the regulatory C cells, which are on the anti-inflammatory side, uh, by giving low-dose uh, low interleukin-2. Uh, and uh, there are a number of attempts to try to harness the adaptive immune system to quell atherosclerosis. So yes, we need to attack both innate immunity and adaptive immunity. And the adaptive immune response may actually be regulating the innate immune response to a great extent. And uh, yes, it's interesting that, that colchicine uh, is used in familial Mediterranean fever, then we learned to use it in pericarditis. And now we should consider using it in patients with cardiovascular disease who meet the entry criteria of LODOCO2 or Colcot. Um, so um, you know, in mice, severe combined immunodeficiency does not protect against uh, against atherosclerosis in the animals that are fed chow. But if you read Jan Breslow's paper carefully, in those who had the hypercholesterolemia, the uh, lack of an adaptive immune response or lack of an immune response uh, was actually associated with about a 40% decrease in lesions. So the, you know, the top line, the title of that paper from a quarter century ago, it was even hard to get grants funded because people said, well, they read the title of the paper and said that 
the immune response is not important in atherosclerosis, but if you read more carefully, it certainly is involved in murine atherosclerosis. And there are now hundreds, if not thousands of papers that substantiate that. So both arms are important. And we need to take many shots on goal to try to thread the needle, to try to find the sweet spot where we can inhibit the inflammatory and immune response without increasing infections, impairing host defenses and tumor surveillance. And then maybe more of a general and also a private question. Um, I'm sure you have thought about the link about um, metabolism inflammation as an instigator of nutrition. So how do you eat and what do you recommend oh, well, to, to, boil, to boil down inflammation? Yeah, look, I, I think it may not be what we eat, but how much we eat and keeping in caloric balance and avoiding obesity may be a key. Um, and, you know, I, I believe and I, I talk to my patients about adopting the Mediterranean style diet uh, because it is sustainable. And we do have some evidence, albeit controversial and fragmentary uh, with uh, randomized trials that the Mediterranean diet uh, may provide cardiovascular benefit. Uh, so at least it's palatable, tasty, uh, generally affordable, and um, something that is sustainable. So uh, I tell my patients, please avoid any diet that has a doctor's name on it. May I also have a final question from my part? Uh, you discussed the global perspective on cardiovascular disease and the increase in cardiovascular disease in the global south. So when it comes to anti-inflammatory treatment, when they become available, do you see rather a challenge then for the global uh, south or a better perspective? Because you may have both. You may have a higher background inflammation in people living in southern countries. And at the same time, there may also be a higher risk when we put these people on anti-inflammatory treatment whenever they become available. So what are your ideas, uh, Western country versus Global South when it comes to anti-inflammatory treatment? Right. So before we deploy expensive uh, therapies that may have adverse effects, let's start with the fundamentals. Um, let's uh, try to improve the environment. Uh, let's try to uh, stop the export of tobacco products, which are now on the decline in the U.S. and in Europe. Uh, but uh, our wonderful tobacco industry in our country is exporting cigarettes and promoting them in foreign climes. Um, and the plethora, the expansion of uh, fast food in the developing world, I think, is contributing to the epidemic of obesity and diabetes. So look, let's let's start with the fundamental things and stop doing bad things before we start to do good things that are expensive and which may entail risks. So from, you know, I wear two hats. I wear my doctor hat. I, you know, saw patients in my clinic on Tuesday. I'll be on call next week. And I love that. And I think that's essential. We all do that. But also, as I've said, I think we have a broader responsibility as citizens to militate for a healthier environment in the globe. And also, of course, to uh, to combat needless human suffering due to conflicts. And you know what I'm talking about. Okay. As our viewers know, with great guests and great talks, uh, one hour always passes quickly. Uh, we had a really fascinating hour with Dr. Libby today. We learned a lot. We learned that the cardiovascular continuum, which we all know, does not end with heart failure, but it goes far beyond and it goes right down into the bone marrow. And um, we even learned that humbleness, um, scientific humbleness, levels the pass for to push boundaries. And it was such a great honor to have you here tonight, Dr. Libby, as our guest on the channel, and to dive so deeply into the field of inflammation and atherosclerosis. And we wish you all the best and thank you again for being with us tonight. Great. Thank you for the invitation. And I hope to see you in situ going forward.